My presentation will combine two quite large topics. Uh, one is a global strategy for human development and second order science. <clears throat> so the overview of my presentation is as follows. My goal is to explain a way of doing social science research that is compatible with an expanded conception of science. So first I'll describe the work of the Institute of Cultural Affairs in the 70s mostly. Second, I shall describe a widely held view of social science research, which I see at my university, uh, practiced by doctoral students and professors. Third, I shall compare the two approaches. And fourth, I shall place the comparison in the context of an expanded conception of science. So, let me describe the work of the Institute of Cultural Affairs. I discovered this organization soon after I arrived uh, in Washington, D.C. to begin my work as a professor. This was in the late 1970s. This was a group of people who had been trained in the ministry, mostly Protestant ministry. They were connected with the World Council of Churches. And they had been working with people who lived in suburbs, affluent people pretty much like us. But they decided to take the Bible seriously and work with people in poor communities. To do this, they would go into a poor community and get to know the people and work with them. And one member of a couple would usually work on Head Start. Now Head Start is a government program which helps uh, poor children get ready for first grade. It's a very effective program. It has a very high return on investment, um, working with poor children before they start school. And then the other member of the couple would work in the community on um, community development projects. They did this in the 60s. Then in 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, the community they were working with burned down in large part. So they had to decide what to do. They decided to start again. So they had a conference of people in the community and people outside the community, business people, people from government, to try to figure out how to redevelop the community and get it going again. This planning conference proved to be very, very successful. So they decided, well, gee, if that worked so well, would it also work in a third world country? And since they were working with the World Council of Churches, they knew people in the Marshall Islands. Now the Marshall Islands are off in the Pacific. It's a developing country. And they used the method there. And again, it was very successful. So they thought, wow, this is nice. Let's do one of these model villages in each of the 24 time zones around the world. So they did that. And they did other projects along the way. Of the 24 projects, they were held in places like Chicago, the Marshall Islands, Northern Australia, India, Indonesia, Venezuela, Kenya, Zambia, Egypt, um, Mississippi, uh, Taiwan, Germany, Nigeria, South Korea. So basically, uh, most places around the world. Now let me show you some slides from one of these projects. Uh, this is Jamaica, just to give you a sense of how things work. They would start their project with a week-long conference. And on the first day, they would say, what is our vision for the future? And the people in the community would say what their vision was. And it was rather predictable. They wanted good schools, health care, jobs, good roads, clean water, etc. On the second day, they would say, OK, if that's what everybody wants, how come you don't already have it? What are the obstacles to achieving the vision? And they would make lists of these things and post them on a wall. You'll see this. Then the third day, they'd say, OK, if those are the obstacles, what are the strategies for removing the obstacles to achieving the vision? Then on the fourth day, they would say, what actions can be taken to implement the strategies for removing the obstacles to achieving the vision? And then they would, on the last day, uh, celebrate the kind, the new businesses that had been created during the week, et cetera. So this is Jamaica. 
north of Kingston in the Blue Mountains. As you can see, it's quite hilly. Oops. Now, you may not be able to see it very clearly, but there's a house there. <laughs> uh, this is what the housing looked like. This is a very advanced poor community. Uh, it's very advanced because there was clean water, clean roads. Uh, every house had a faucet in front of it, so it was clean mountain water. Before, and the houses were in pretty good shape. I mean, they, they had houses with metal roofs and so forth. Um, before the conference started, they painted these houses. So here's a little shop. Uh, it's kind of your um, snack foods uh, shop. And these people were the descendants of slaves. Uh, and this was the manor house of the slave owners back in the 1800s. That's where they put consultants like me. Uh, and this is the, um, the meeting place. It's a church, probably an Anglican church since it's a former British colony. As you can see, it's very hilly. This is the kitchen where the food was prepared. The cleanup crew were the chickens and the little pigs. They became dinner later. Uh, and here, once again, you can see how advanced this community was. The children had uniforms, and they had a very devoted teacher in the school. And so here you see some of the meetings that were held. So that the group, the consultants and the local people would meet for breakfast, lunch, and dinner each day. And each day was devoted to one of the topics that I mentioned. Here's one of the guys going to work in his field. Uh, we organized two field trips for the people during the week. One was to a fruit canning factory so that they could get a sense of the jobs that were available in the nearby area. We also organized a trip to a uh, furniture factory so that they could see other jobs that were available in the area. And then we would come back and talk about uh, the topic of the day. Uh, the guy on the left is a geologist from an oil company in Houston. The woman on the right is one of the uh, two or three couples who would stay in the village uh, with the people. She had been in northern Australia in a rather inaccessible place, but she was pregnant, and they wanted to get her to a location where she would have access to medical care if problems developed with the pregnancy, so she was reassigned to Jamaica, which was considered a very civilized place. Um, and then in the evenings, we would write up the results of what had been discussed during the day, and the children would gather around, and they were very interested that we were so actively involved in writing things and so forth. The average family size was about six or seven children per family, and very often the older children would go off to Britain where they could uh, be accepted because it was part of the British Empire. And then during the week, they organized a preschool. This is a way of getting the children ready for first grade. Also released the mothers um, to set up their own businesses and to work together. They wouldn't have to take care of the children all day long. Now the guys in the village uh, wanted to get rid of this rock. Uh, they played uh, cricket, since it's a British. But, and this was a granite outcropping. I thought the only way of getting rid of it was dynamite. But one of the guys had experience in road building in Nigeria, and he said, you just need to work at it. So they would uh, get a, a wedge and a sledgehammer, and they would bang on the cracks. And then they'd build a fire on it to get it nice and hot. Then they'd throw water on it, which would crack it, and then they'd bang on it some more. Uh, and that's the way it was when I left. They got it down below ground level, smoothed it off, and so forth. So that was a symbol of what the community could accomplish by working together using knowledge from area experts. And that was applied across the board in business, agriculture, uh, social relations, etc. So I went to uh, first a project in Washington, D.C., then a project in Zambia. Two years later, I went to Guatemala and Jamaica. 
And then soon thereafter, I was elected president of the American Society for Cybernetics, which had had troubles. They had split um, into an American uh, Washington-based society and a Philadelphia-based society. The guy in the middle, Barry Clemson, had brought the two groups together. My job was to get the society moving again. So we held a planning meeting, just like was done in the poor communities. It worked extremely well. Uh, and here are some slides from that. Okay, so going back to the Institute of Cultural Affairs. After doing 24 of these model villages around the world, they did a second set of 24 projects around the world in the late 70s and early 80s. When they did the project in India, they told the governor of the state of Maharashtra what they had done. And he said, one village is a curiosity. I have a thousand villages. So the Institute of Cultural Affairs decided they would set up a training school. So they did. And they brought in community organizers from nearby villages and over time had an impact on the state of Maharashtra, which is uh, where Mumbai is located. They did the same thing in Kenya. They also did other projects. Uh, they had something called town meeting. They organized a one-day meeting in each county in the United States in 1976 to celebrate the bicentennial of the Declaration of Independence. And they did this in other countries, in countries where they had established a human development project. They also organized global women's forums, particularly in Africa, Middle East, India, to discuss books and to discuss with women possibilities of different kinds of relationships in society and so forth. And then they got a grant from UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, to hold a meeting in India in 1983 where they brought together projects conducted by many non-governmental organizations. Church organizations are active around the world. Uh, Catholic Relief, Lutheran Relief, American Friends Service Committee, and so forth. And they wanted to bring together the best projects that they could find. So that, for example, over the years prior to 1983, they would hold a meeting in Virginia to get together projects. Uh, and they would pick the best ones. Then they would do the east coast of the United States, and they would pick the best projects. Then they'd do the whole country, and they'd pick the best projects. And they did this in each country, and then they brought those best projects together in New Delhi, and they published several volumes called Sharing Approaches That Work uh, in Rural Development. Now, what other non-governmental organizations would do, it, it, it was very interesting to visit one of these countries, and. Uh, to talk to people in the airports and on the airplanes. They would get themselves a hotel room in the capital city, and then each day they would get in their Range Rovers and go out to the poor communities and then come back in. And each organization would have its own thing. Some would dig water wells, some would build churches, some would build schools, some would improve housing. What the Institute of Cultural Affairs did was to teach participatory methods so that people would learn how to work together to define their needs and to create relationships with people with resources in business and government. I thought that was a very clever strategy and that's why I preferred to work with them. So each summer, they would gather in Chicago, where they were originally based, to define the programs for the coming year. Then they would go out to the communities around the world and implement the programs they had designed. And they established the connections in these poor villages through the World Council of Churches. Then the next summer they would come back to Chicago, reflect on what worked and what didn't work, and design the next year's programs. So it was a recursive, reflective process of experimentation, reconsideration, experimentation, reconsideration, etc. Now the financial model, uh, which ultimately broke down simply because the organization grew dramatically fast, um, 
In each community, there were two or three couples, and one person would work in an embassy school to earn money. The other would work full-time in community development. So they were largely self-supporting, although at a very low income level. And donations to ICA paid for international travel. And basically what their activity was, was to set up institutions like farmers' cooperatives, businessmen's cooperatives, preschools, uh, parent-teachers associations, and they would then bring in outside experts to work with these groups. For example, in Zambia, I took a group from the community into the University of Zambia in Lusaka, and we found a business professor who said he would go out to the community to teach basic accounting and bookkeeping and small business methods. And I found a Pakistani wheat expert who thought that Zambia was a great place to grow wheat, but they weren't growing wheat. So he wanted a, a village that he could work with to teach them how to grow wheat. And so we put him in touch with the people in the community we were working with. They found that they could double or triple the uh, average family income in a period of a few years simply by using irrigation and fertilizer. And they could connect people to resources, uh, teachers, uh, business people, and so forth. So a great deal could be done in a very short period of time. Okay, now I encountered this soon after I arrived in Washington to begin teaching, and I then began teaching organizational behavior, which I had never studied before. And I thought that's what the Institute of Cultural Affairs was doing. But I found I was not able to interest my colleagues in organizational behavior in the work of the Institute of Cultural Affairs. Uh, and I was puzzled about this because I thought it was very good work. So in any case, I then began teaching philosophy of science and research methods for doctoral students in the School of Business. And the way we did it was you'd take a theory and test it by collecting and analyzing data. Experiments were supposed to be replicable by others, and the researcher tries to be objective. The research is an effort to find causal relationships, this is the simplest approach, between variables at a high level of statistical significance. The goal is reliable knowledge, not to change society directly, maybe down the road somewhere by somebody else, but not by the researcher. And success is measured by the number of papers in leading academic journals. So how did the Institute of Cultural Affairs do research? Well, they would read widely. They would start with current knowledge. They would learn by doing. They would change methods as needed. And then the methods would be used to additional communities. So you're constantly in the process of devising methods and changing methods and using the methods in additional communities. It's very much like quality improvement in the business world. The researchers established personal relationships with the local people. They tried to get to really know them. The goal was to improve the quality of life, health, income, education, as quickly as possible by using available knowledge and expertise. Success was measured by higher standards of living, and the spread of participatory methods to nearby communities, like through human development training schools, and by recruitment to ICA. The number of people interested in what they were doing rose dramatically. There was reflection and redesign was done at least annually, and they would have these meetings quite frequently. And then they developed networks of supportive people uh, to continue to provide advice and resources when needed. So then you can ask, well, okay, if that's what seems to work out in the field, why is social science so abstract? Well, amongst my colleagues at the university, there was a desire to imitate physics or their conception of physics. Uh, there was a desire to be quantitative, not merely qualitative. There was a preference for general knowledge, not culture-specific knowledge. The observer was assumed to be outside the system, and a theory of a system is assumed not to alter the behavior of the system. 
which works pretty well in physics, but not in social systems. But the Institute was deeply involved in the communities. They were trying to improve the lives of villagers. They worked to resolve conflicts. Since they were trained in the ministry rather than in science, they were concerned with emotions and spiritual feelings and cultural beliefs and practices. And they tried to create a shared mentality of concern for the community, not just individual advancement. Okay, now let me say something about second order science. Carl Miller has suggested that first order science is exploring the world. Second order science is reflecting on those explorations. So any critique, I would say, of first order science would qualify as second order science. Science can be expanded by focusing on personal behavior. That's what cybernetics did. That it, uh, purposeful behavior, whether it's a machine, an individual, an organization, a nation, that isn't encompassed by uh, physics or the natural sciences. Okay, so we could shift our thinking from viewing science as creating descriptions of systems to viewing science as an active part of social systems. It's embedded in society. We would think about the coevolution of theories and society. Now let's ask the question, why do we create scientific knowledge? Well, we want to understand how the world works. But also, we want to act effectively. We want to achieve our goals with minimum effort or expenditure of resources. Knowledge from science is used to achieve our purposes, both as individuals and as organizations. So first order knowledge, how the world works, is used by purposeful systems. Purposeful systems is larger than scientific knowledge. Now I think it's easy to accept the notion that theories affect society. We create theories because we hope people will accept them, act on them, society will perhaps better, operate better. In the natural sciences, we assume theories do not affect what is studied. And there's a tendency to carry over these assumptions from the physical sciences to the social sciences, at least on my campus, because we think that's the way you do science. But we can remove our self-imposed blinders and expand our conception of science. That's my conception of second order science. And let me just, to justify all of this as an expansion of science, let me refer you to the correspondence principle which I may have mentioned here before. This is the notion that any new theory should reduce to the old theory to which it corresponds to those cases in which the old theory is known to hold. That is, a new dimension is added. For example, in the gas laws, you can assume that the molecules have a point mass. They have no diameter. But as you begin to compress the gas molecules, you see that the diameter becomes important. So you have to add the dimension of the diameter of the gas molecules. That's adding a dimension. In relativity theory, adding relative velocity wasn't an issue in Newtonian mechanics. It wasn't an issue in relativity theory. So you've added a dimension. So what I'm suggesting is that you add attention to the observer and the effect of the theory on the phenomenon, and you have expanded science uh, using the correspondence principle. So I'll stop there, take any questions in the discussion.